Look, we can stay uh, with the topic of Gabon here on France 24. Paul Melly is a consulting fellow of the uh, Africa programme at Chatham House. Paul, thanks for speaking to us uh, this evening. Uh, Africa experiencing then, you might say, a, a déjà vu, a, a similar scene that we saw in Niger just, just weeks ago now. Uh, what do you make of the timing of this? Of course, this coup d'etat taking place just after uh, the president had uh, won, if you will, a third term in office. Your thoughts on that? Well... I think that's where there's a big difference between what's happening in Gabon and what has happened in Niger. In Niger, the presidential election was in 2021. It was broadly credible. Uh, the president appeared to be fairly popular. He was fairly effective. Uh, whereas in Gabon, um, we've had a president who had just been announced as the winner of his third presidential election, but in the middle of the night after a period of no transparency, and his two previous elections in 2009 and 2016 clouded in opacity, controversy, disputes over the credibility of the vote, etc. So we have a rather different situation. Also, the president in Gabon, uh, Ali Bongo, uh, he had suffered a serious stroke in 2018. And although he'd made a reasonable recovery in health terms, people were still asking questions about how effective he really was, how capable he really was as somebody who could lead the government. So yeah. I think a lot of different situations, actually. I mean, amid those questions of kind of credibility of this election, it's fair to say that the Bongo family has ultimately been one of Africa's largest kind of reigning or longest, I should say, dynasties. What do we know about popular support for the Bongo family? Well, uh, Ali Bongo's father, Omar Bongo, who was president for 42 years, from 1967 to 2009, he was quite shrewd. Uh, of course, he came to power originally in the era of authoritarian one-party regimes, etc. But when, at the beginning of the 1990s, French-speaking African countries, basically there was a, a regional trend, a a wave of popular protest demanding the shift to multi-party politics, he adapted to that. And so um, he managed to sort of surf on the wave and remain as president, even in a multi-party system. But he had all the levers of power of the incumbent, uh, the government machine. And in practice, although there were a whole series of elections, um, Omar Bongo always emerged the winner. The PDG, his governing party, always emerged the winner. And that continued under his son, Ali. But people had got tired. Africa has changed, of course, in this time. The Africa of, of today is very, very different, even from the Africa of the early 1990s, let alone the time when Omar Bongo took power back in the 60s. And many people are much more urbanized. There are many more young people and they're much better educated. And of course, social media, the internet and so on, they have a much better idea of what's going on in the outside world. So the expectations were much higher. I mean, we, we've spoken uh, as well, you and I, Paul, during uh, this coup d'etat uh, regarding uh, Niger. Um, there was a lot of calls for ECOWAS to kind of, you know, step in to do something to convince these military leaders to, uh, you know, reinstall constitutional uh, uh, rule. Who's likely to put pressure on Gabon uh, to do the same or Gabon's military uh, leaders to do the same? Can ECAS do anything? Are we expecting uh, the same uh, kind of momentum uh, from this regional bloc? Uh, not really. ECAS is a much, much weaker bloc. Uh, ECOWAS, West Africa, has always had a strong sense of regional identity and the ECOWAS bloc has had a a, con a protocol on governance and democratic and good governance since 2001. And although it hasn't been always been honored, it's given the region a sort of roadmap and legitimacy. That's not true in the Central African region at all. The ECAS bloc um, is a much, much looser grouping. And many of the member states are still under authoritarian rule, Equatorial Guinea, Congo Brazzaville, uh, Chad, arguably. Um, these are not countries very well placed to demand a setting of standards, if you like. So they can use the phrase constitutional rule, but uh, 
if they start to use the phrase democracy, it's going to look quite frail and their capacity to exercise pressure is much, much more limited. I mean, just a final question for you, you Paul, uh, in terms of this. Uh, the opposition, if you listen to uh, the last uh, kind of uh, interviews, they say that this coup leader is essentially just an extension of uh, the Bongo dynasty, the Bongo family. What do we know about the man who is taking charge, who's at the forefront of this coup d'etat in Gabon? Well, General Ngema is actually a cousin of Ali Bongo. Now, of course, with extended families and so on, that doesn't mean that he's the closest member of the family, but certainly the opposition are arguing Albert Ondo uh, Esahu, who, the man who uh, was the main challenger to, uh, uh, to Ali Bongo in the presidential election last weekend, has argued that essentially it's a, a sort of palace a palace revolution here, or a palace putsch, if you like. He says it's not really a true coup d'etat. It's not really a complete change of regime. He's suggested that other members of the Bongo family are behind it, sort of feeling that uh, the, his underlying message appeared to be that they felt that Ali could no longer cope with being president, so they needed to change personnel. But I don't think that's the whole story because Gabon does have a serious, significant, vibrant civil society. There are plenty of people whose expectations are quite high. Opposition parties and civil society who feel that even if the elite feel they're reshuffling within a sort of inner coterie, but wider civil society is expecting a serious step towards democracy. and. Uh, uh, the new leader, General Ngema, has in fact had a meeting with the opposition, with political parties today, and um, he's promised to try and get them involved. So in the discussions about the route forward, and there, okay. there's going to be quite a lot of manoeuvring, I think, to see whether he ends up ignoring their views or is really forced to take them on board. All right, Paul, on that note of Gabon's uh, roadmap ahead, that's where we leave things. Uh, thanks for sharing your expertise with yeah. us this evening. Thanks so much.